At Oxford, Shelley wears his hair in long shanks, like a lion's mane or meteor's tail, to show solidarity with the spirit of 1792, unlike the fashions of the right for adopting close-cropped military styles by way of homage to Wellington's troops, then engaged in an ugly peninsular war. Shelley adopts the ideological haircut of a free spirit. But to Oxford's authorities, the poet's surpassing himself, and they fulminate in their common rooms and at their high tables. Mere republicanism can't contain his disaffection. He must write an incendiary hymn to a fruit knife, as wielded by a mad wretch now in Bedlam. Moreover, Shelley's now sending his atheist pamphlets to the heads of each Oxford college, cosily ensconced in their neo-Gothic confections, each college named after a saint or God's son. Shelley's promptly tried by the university authorities for saying, If ignorance of nature gave birth to gods, knowledge of nature is made for their destruction. He's tried for exposing Oxford's aversion to sense. For his pains, he's subjected to, as he puts it, Oxford's violent, tyrannical feelings, and his pamphlets, atheistical and anti-monarchical, are incinerated in Slatter and Mundy's black grate. On trial, Shelley says, It is easier to suppose that the universe has existed for all eternity than to conceive a being beyond its limits capable of creating it, besides which such a creator would need creating, and so on, ad absurdum. Shelley believes that atoms have chanced together to create man, so any prayers to unknown powers are in vain. For, as the planet spins round, where can they accurately be aimed, these random prayers hurtling into space? Shelley's not to be the puppet of some fear-inducing being, but rather feels he's a mass of electrified clay which plays freely and is unendingly mutable, and at his trial he defends his position with passion. Since the astronomer Herschel has shown the solar system to be infinite, and that the universe contains billions of inhabitable planets, no narrow concept of a single Redeemer can be sustained, for there would be so many other fallen worlds to redeem, and so the idea of God being born and being crucified on each and every planet becomes absurd. Shelley then paints a farcical picture of God invigilating his infinite galactic machine, where, despite Sirius being fifty-four trillion miles from Earth, the Almighty can still hot-foot it to Palestine to begat a son upon the body of a Jewish woman in order to save mankind. And Shelley says of this gymnastic clowning, God's works have borne witness against him. Every reflecting mind must acknowledge that there is no proof of the existence of a deity. And then, as if his notion had constituted a scientific proof, the poet rounds it off with relish. Q.E.D. At his trial, the master of his college insists Shelley's ideas must have derived from Tom Paine, and he challenges Shelley by saying he knows that his mentor, the author of Common Sense, has played a part in the French Revolution, as well as his stirring up the American colonies to rebel, and he firmly insists that Oxford be spared Thomas Paine's uncommonly disagreeable views. You have the gall to ask, the master says, waving the pamphlet in Shelley's face, by what authority does the king reign? And then you ask, on what grounds does the church claim ascendancy? Such questions, the master says, stabbing his finger at Shelley, are seditious, and sedition is a capital offence. The master has also taken legal advice with regard to blasphemous libel, and he announces to all those whom he summoned 
that his advisers have clearly stated. The public importance of the Christian religion is so great that no one's to be allowed to deny its truth. The history of the offence of blasphemous libel confirms that the world holds this view. So then, this gaggle of biddable dons, whom the master has impanelled to hear Shelley's case, come to agree that if the blasphemer remains there any longer, any respect the university has will be lost. Should Shelley turn the student body seditionary, Oxford could be depopulated, the master adds melodramatically, and all Shelley's duped followers could be taken to Traitor's Gate or to Tyburn Tree, there to be hanged. Thus, any idea that Oxford stands for freedom of thought is soon crushed by this Christian Taliban, all turning on Shelley as his expulsion is announced, with one cleric snidely muttering, Q.E.D. The book burnings are supervised by a senior theologian, and not one of Oxford's great minds addresses a single one of Shelley's contentions, but instead keeps a self-serving silence. Or, in much the same way as Shelley's own father, in equine fashion, as Shelley puts it, will only whinny, I believe, because I believe. The five thousand intellectuals at Oxford claim blind faith is the only proof they require. A friend, seeing Shelley in London shortly afterwards, has Shelley burst in on him at dawn to announce, I've been expelled for atheism, then collapse. Shelley describes in detail being skewered by the dreaming spires, and heatedly repeats Epicurus, whom he cited, and whose arguments, Shelley insists, are timeless and remain unanswerable, save to the irrational. Is God willing to prevent evil, but unable? Then he's not omnipotent. Is he able, but not willing? Then he's malevolent. Is he both able and willing? Then whence does evil come? Is God neither able nor willing? Then why do you call him God? His friend tries to change his opinions for his own good, but finds Shelley unrepentant, even vehement. Do not talk such stuff to me. I hear enough of it at home. There is my father, who, with a painting of that impostor Christ hanging up in his library, is sometimes vain enough to suppose that he can make reason bow down before absurdity. I have too many of these follies before my eyes. They drive me mad. To Shelley, bribes of heaven and warnings of hell only betray two ridiculous assumptions. And he once asked a baby on Magdalen Bridge, to the bewilderment of the baby's mother, whether or not it might remember its pre-existence, that is, before it was born. And Shelley would remonstrate in an anguished voice whenever compelled to attend church, or to kneel obediently to hear the word of God. If God has spoken, why is the world not convinced? Shelley wondered if there was something about Oxford's damp, misty air that made people open to will o' the wisps. As for his expulsion and Oxford's death threats, its continuing talk of prosecution for sedition, rather than quelling his urge to transform the world, they make him more outspoken than ever. <laughs>